All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to HL Chemistry with Mr. Kenton. And hope you guys are doing well today and that uh, you're excited to be here. I'm excited to be here as we're continuing our discussion through topic one, which is covering stoichiometric relationships, which should be a review for most of us. And what we're going to be looking at today has to deal with how we can determine whether or not a reactant is a limiting reactant or an excess reactant, and also how do we determine the experimental versus the theoretical yield, and then ultimately the percent yield within a given process. Now, you know, something to consider as we think through chemical reactions, right, that when we're doing reactions, eventually the reaction is going to come to a stop. If, it, if it's going to completion, if it's not an equilibrium process. And so what that means is that once one of your reactants, one of your components is completely consumed, no new product can be made because one of the components is missing, right? And so it's an important task for chemists and even for us to be able to identify, okay, what are my limiting reactants? What are my excess reactants? What's going to cause this process to stop because I'm going to run out of it over the course of the, the reaction? So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's ultimately what you're going to be able to do after watching this video, hopefully it's just going to remind you, but to be able to solve problems as it relates to reacting quantities, limiting and excess reactants, and then using theoretical and experimental yields to ultimately determine the percentage yields, right? And when you start thinking about industry, industry is a place where they're looking for high percentage yields, high experimental yields, so that the processes that they're doing are going to be efficient, but also they're going to be profitable to them, right? Now, when we start to think about limiting reactants and what we need to consider here, Remember, this is the reactant that's going to we're going to run out of first in our given chemical reaction, right? And you think about it in terms of like if you're trying to make a peanut butter sandwich, for example, um, if you're trying to make a full sandwich, you need two slices of bread, some peanut butter, and you know that's all you need. But if you only have one slice of bread and the peanut butter, you can't really make a full sandwich. You can make a half sandwich. But your bread is what you're going to consume first, and so you would run out of bread before you could make more sandwiches. And so the same thing is true in chemical reactions, that one of your reactants is going to be used up first. And so then your excess reactant, that's the thing that's going to be left over. So think about it this way. The reaction takes place. You've got your new product that forms, but then you're also going to still have in your container or in your vessel that you're reacting with, you're still going to have some of that excess reactant that wasn't consumed in that given process. And that's just something to remember that just because we're doing a chemical reaction doesn't necessarily mean that all of our reactants are completely gone. It's important to kind of remind ourselves, yeah, there are still some things that are left over that still might be in this container. Now, when you're given a limiting reactant problem, the single most defining characteristic within a limiting reactant problem is that you're going to be given two givens in the problem. So two pieces of information that are quantitative that tell you about the substances that are reacting, right? So typically you're only given one piece of information and from there you're using that piece of information to maneuver and work through to whatever unit you're being asked for. But in limiting reactant problems, you have two givens. And so if we look at the following example, you've got 2H2 plus O2 makes two water molecules or two moles of water. If we look at this example problem, it says if four moles of hydrogen react with eight moles of oxygen, how much water will be formed? Okay. And so what we should notice right off the bat is that in this particular problem, it tells us that we have four moles of hydrogen, and we have eight moles of oxygen. And so in that particular case, we've got our two givens, and they're ultimately asking us to find how much water 
will be formed. So what we're going to need to figure out is, okay, which of those reactants is going to be consumed first? Because that's going to determine how much water I can make, right? So let's take a, a deeper look at this particular example. All right, so here's the calculations. Here's some things that you would consider or maybe even a process you could use as you're going through and doing this. So the first step is going to be to write down and convert both of the givens to moles if they're not already in moles, right? Because again, moles allows us to communicate very clearly and concisely in terms of, of chemical quantity. So moles is always a good unit to get ourselves into so that we can figure out where to do, go from there. Now, your second step, once you've converted both of your givens into moles, you're going to set up two stoichiometric problems where the opposite reactant is part of the mole ratio because you're essentially trying to figure out how much of this other reactant do I need to react with this particular component in order to make my product, right? And so if we're thinking about that previous example with the hydrogen and oxygen, right, if we're given four moles of H2, and I do like that it's mentioned here that we have four moles of H2 given, so we know that, okay, four moles of H2 given, we use the mole ratio, two moles of H2 to one mole of O2. That means that I need, in order for four moles of H2 to react, I need two moles of O2 in order for all of it to completely react. That makes sense, right? Now, on the flip side, we've got eight moles of O2 that we're given, and the mole ratio is two to one, so two moles of H2 for every one mole of O2. And that communicates that we need 16 moles of H2 in order to completely consume eight moles of oxygen. Now, if you're looking at our givens now, we've got our needs and our givens. If we look at how much oxygen is needed, we only need two moles of oxygen, but we're given eight moles of oxygen. Whereas we're given four moles of hydrogen, but we would need 16 moles of hydrogen in order to react all of the oxygen. So what that's indicating to us is that the hydrogen is our limiting reactant. So you, step three, you interpret the equations by crossing and comparing to determine the limiting reactant, which is what I just did. We compared the given amounts compared to the needed amounts. And like we said, we need two moles of oxygen and we have eight moles of oxygen, so we got plenty. But we need 16 moles of hydrogen but we were only given four moles of hydrogen in the problem or in this scenario. So since we don't have enough hydrogen, we're going to run out of that first. And so hydrogen is our limiting reactant in this particular process. Now, that question asks us, how much water could we make? So then what we're going to do is we're going to use the limiting reactant to determine how much water we can actually make. Because again, think about it from the, the sandwich example. If I have one slice of bread, maybe I should have said three. If I have three slices of bread, I can only make one full sandwich, right? Because um, after that, I don't have enough bread to make an additional sandwich. So in this case, once I use up all of my hydrogen, I can't make any more water. So we want to use that value from the hydrogen to determine how much water we can make. All right, so let's look at the same equation, but now we're going to change it a little bit. Instead of dealing with moles, take a look at gram quantities, right? So how many grams of water are formed when 12 grams of hydrogen reacts with 17 grams of oxygen? All right, so again, when I'm looking at this, we can already see, all right, I've got 12 grams of hydrogen, 17 grams of oxygen. I've got two givens, so this is a limiting reactant problem. Right, and so within this, in order to figure out how many grams of water, like that's my ultimate question that I'm trying to work through, I need to figure out which of these is my limiting reactant. Is it the hydrogen or is it the oxygen? So we're just gonna follow the steps that we introduced on the previous slide. So step one, we're gonna convert everything to moles. So we got 12 grams of hydrogen, convert that to moles, you've got 5.94 moles of hydrogen. You take the 17 grams of oxygen, divide it by its molar mass, which is 32, 
So we have 0.531 moles of oxygen that have been given to us. And again, notice this word here. We've got given. So this is what we have. That's what we've been given from our particular problem. Now what we can do is once we have those given quantities, we can then use those to figure out how much is needed of each of those substances in order to figure out which one's my limiting versus my excess reacting. All right, so we're going to transfer those numbers and we're going to go to the next step by converting this to moles of the opposite substance to see how much we need in order for it to completely react. So when we look at the hydrogen, we knew that we had 5.94 moles of hydrogen given. We used the mole ratio, so one mole of oxygen to two moles of hydrogen. That means that we need 2.97 moles of oxygen are needed in order to react with all of that hydrogen. Right? But with our oxygen, we've got the 0 0.531 moles of oxygen given. We use our mole ratio 2 to 1. Only 1.06 moles of hydrogen are needed. So now we can cross-reference those values. And so what we should notice pretty quickly is, all right, we've got 5.94 moles of hydrogen given. That's way more than what's needed to react with all the oxygen. But you look at the oxygen, the amount of oxygen that's given does not match up with the amount of oxygen that's needed. So that means that oxygen is our limiting reactant. Now, on the flip side of that, hydrogen is our excess reactant. So now that we've identified oxygen as our limiting reactant, we can then proceed forward and calculate how many grams of water we can produce using our limiting reactant, oxygen. Right. And so just to keep in mind here, be sure that when you go through this calculation, if you're using this particular method, start with the given amount of moles, not the needed amount of moles, because you need to figure out how much is going to be produced based on what you're given. Right. So we want moles to mass, essentially. So we got 0.531 moles of oxygen. Use the mole ratio, two moles of water to one mole of oxygen and then multiply it by its molar mass, 18.02. And so what we find is that 0.531 moles of oxygen is able to produce 19.1 grams of water. So based on the conditions that we were given, the 12 grams of hydrogen, the 17 grams of oxygen, we can produce 19.1 grams of water. And that's based on the limiting reactant. So that's how much water we could produce. However, you might be asked um, to figure out how much of your excess is left over as well. And um, you could be asked to do that. Now with this, remember this number here, this 19.1 grams of water. This is what's going to be your theoretical yield. This is assuming that the reaction that you're carrying out is 100% efficient, that you're not gonna lose any product, all of your reactants are going to be consumed um, and nothing is going to be lost in the process. So 19.1 grams is our theoretical yield for this particular reaction. Now, let's say that you were asked how much of the excess reactant remained. Well, the way that we've got this set up, kind of the nice thing that we can do is since we know how many moles of hydrogen were needed and we also know how many moles of hydrogen were given, we can simply subtract those two values and figure out how many moles of excess hydrogen were left over. So if we think back, we had 5.94 moles of hydrogen given, 1.06 moles of hydrogen were needed, and so therefore 4.88 moles of hydrogen are present in excess. Now, they didn't ask for it in grams or anything like that, so you could just simply leave it in moles and then you're done. I hope that makes sense. This, like I said, this should be review for us. And so, you know, as we're looking at that particular problem, I want you guys to kind of, you're going to pause the video.
I'm going to work out the problem while you pause it. But let's take a look at this limiting reactant example. I want you to work it out. It says if you have 6.70 moles of sodium reacting with 3.20 moles of chlorine, what is your limiting reactant? How many moles of product will be formed? And how much excess reactant remains? So notice in there you got three questions. You got to figure out what's your limiting reactant. You got to figure out moles of product that are formed and how much of your excess is left over. So take a second, pause the video, work this out, come up with your answers, and then come back through and I'm going to be working this out. Okay, so hopefully you pause the video. And so I'm just going to simply start by taking my moles of both of my substances and figuring out how much I need of each, right? So I was told that I have 6.70 moles of Na. And so what I know from that is that I'm going to need for every 2 moles of Na, that's going to react with 1 mole of Cl2. So my moles of Na that I started with, that's what I'm given. That means that I'm going to need 3.35 moles of Cl2, right? Now, we want to compare it just to make sure, but right now we can already tell I need more moles of Cl2 um, than what I actually have. Now, with the Cl2, I've got 3.20 moles of chlorine. Use my mole ratio for every two moles of Na. That requires one mole of Cl2. And that's going to give me 6.40 moles of Na. Now, both of these are the needed amounts that I've shown over here. And so when we look at what I have, I've got 6.7 moles of sodium. I need 6.40. I've got enough. I've been given 3.20 moles of Cl2, but I need 3.35 moles of Cl2. So based on this particular calculation, we've just determined that our limiting reactant, so our LR, is Cl2, right? Now, if we wanted to figure out how much product is formed, that should be pretty straightforward. So give me a second. Let me erase. No, just erase everything, right? And then we'll go back. Like we said, the limiting reactant is Cl2. That means our excess is Na. Now, what we need to do to figure out how much product is formed we take our 3.20 moles of Cl2, convert that to product. So we know for every 2 moles of NaCl, requires 1 mole Cl2. So there we're going to get 6.40 moles of NaCl. So this is how much product is formed. That was our second question. And then our last question, how much of our excess reactant remains? Well, if you pause the video, you could always go back and look at it. But we determined that we had 6.70 moles of sodium. And it was going to need 6.40 moles to react so then we would have 0 0.30 moles of Na in excess. So hopefully you got those answers. I'm pretty confident you guys would be able to get that. So that's how you would solve that particular limiting reactant problem. Now, last little thing I want to look at in this video is theoretical experimental yield, and ultimately percent yield, which should be pretty quick. So just bear with me a little bit longer. All right. So experimental yield can be different from the theoretical yield, right? So you guys have done lab stuff before, and you can imagine maybe you were 
trying to react something specifically. You mixed it, you got your products, but then when you did your calculations, you found, wait a minute, the amount that I got out of this process was less than what I anticipated. Um, or maybe you were trying to determine a volume of gas that should have been produced or something like that. Um, if you guys remember doing the molar mass of an unknown gas where you depressed the lighter underneath the water and it displaced the water in the graduated cylinder, you know, certain things could happen. Maybe you depress the gas that's in the lighter and one of the, the bubbles doesn't go into the, the cylinder. And so you lost that particular amount of your gas. Well, that's going to throw off your data. So this is just communicating your experimental yield can be different from your theoretical yield. And that's okay. Our goal is, though, we want to make sure that our experimental yield is as close to the theoretical yield as possible. So your theoretical yield, this is the maximum amount of product that can be produced from a given amount of the reactant. And this is simply found when you do the stoichiometry. Like when you do a limiting reactant problem, like we identified previously, once you've consumed your limiting reactant and you get whatever amount of product you're trying to make, that's your theoretical yield. That is theoretically how much you can get if everything goes 100% right. Now, your experimental yield, this is what you measure from actually going through and doing the experiment in a lab, right? And I think it's important to note that just because your experimental yield doesn't equal your theoretical yield, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are a bad scientist or a bad chemist. There might, be, there might be something that you did that would indicate that you were a bad scientist or a bad chemist, but it might have to do with the, the type of equipment that you're using, or, or maybe there was something that happened that was outside of your control. So I, just, I mentioned this just so that we understand that there are a lot of different reasons for why your experimental yield can be different from your theoretical yield, okay? And so if your theoretical and experimental yield are not really close, doesn't necessarily mean that it was all your fault. All right, doesn't mean that you're a bad scientist or a bad chemist. So don't get down if you're if you ever find that happening. Okay. Now to calculate your percent yield, pretty straightforward. You take your percent yield is going to be equal to the experimental yield, so that's what you got in the lab, divided by the theoretical value you would get from the stoichiometry, and you multiply it by 100. Now just like I gave you some things to look for for a limiting reactant problem, some things that you should be able to recognize with a percent yield problem is um, the types of things they're going to ask you for, um, right? So the experimental value will be given to you in the problem, so they'll tell you, in an experiment, such and such product was obtained. And then they'll ask you to calculate the theoretical yield by using stoichiometry. What that might entail is that you're having to do a limiting reactant problem first in order to identify what your theoretical yield should be. Or they could be nice to you and say, hey, this was our excess reactant. This is the reactant that was limiting. Based on all this, figure out your, your percent yield. Right, so let's look at our favorite reaction. We've been looking at this reaction pretty much all unit, right? Um, so you got your hydrogen plus oxygen producing your water. So if 17 grams of oxygen reacts to form 18.7 grams of water, what is the percent yield? Now, the nice thing is, if you remember, this is actually from what we did previously. So we have our 17 grams of oxygen, 18.7 grams of water is produced. What is our percent yield? Well, we know that we've got our experimental yield. This is right here. So this is our experimental yield, right? And then we've got that. We know we need that. And so then our next task would be converting that into, all right, how many grams of water to 17 grams of oxygen? How much is it supposed to produce? Now, you should recognize we did that already. That was from our limiting reactant problem earlier. It's supposed to yield us 19.1 grams of water. So, not that big of a difference, so that looks pretty good. So then we want to figure out what's our percent yield. Well, we're going to take our experimental, which is the 18.7, divide it by 19.1, and then multiply by 100, which gives us a 97.9% .9 yield. That's pretty good. 
right? So 97.9% yield, you're going to be doing a lot of really good work. You're going to have a lot of labs wanting to work with you because you're getting a pretty high yield from the reaction that you're carrying out. And from an industry perspective, the higher those yields are, the more efficient your process, the less waste you have. And so the more likely they're going to want to use that process if they're having to manufacture something. So I hope that makes sense as it pertains to um, limiting reactants, excess reactants, experimental yields, theoretical yields, and even percent yields. I hope this video was helpful for you guys. Thank you so much for stopping by, and I look forward to seeing you guys again real soon. Take care.